Okay, so this will be a little bit different of a lecture. Um, seeing as I'm the only one here. So I'll still go through the slides and uh, and record some some points on each of them. Oh, hi. Hi. I'm the first one here. You are. I was just about to start lecturing to the empty room just to record it. I think I saw Hannah like okay. drive up at that. I was getting out. So well, then we'll just we'll just pause for a second. Yeah, then. I've never been the first one. Hey, Anna. Good day. It's okay. I've we've all been late before. It just it just happened that everybody was a little bit late on the same day. With only three students, that happens. I love it. I love it. All right. So. It may have been one point. I was debating whether to just leave the slides up and uh, not do the lecture or or um, to uh, just lecture to the empty room and record it, um, which would have been a really fast lecture probably. Yeah. Um, and actually just as a, just to go along with the rules for what foods are appropriate to bring to class that we've talked about before. Um, there's the, does everybody know the rules for when people, when somebody's late, especially for, for an instructor, it's, um, five minutes, you wait five minutes out of courtesy and then five minutes for every degree that they have that you don't. <laughs> so if it's a meeting of a bunch of PhDs, you're only expected to wait for five minutes and then you can get up and leave. But if you don't have your bachelor's yet, let, yet, and you're being lectured by somebody who has their PhD, then you're expected to wait 20 minutes before you can just assume class is canceled. I've never heard that before. It's not like it's written down in, in uh, Roger's rules of order or anything like that, but it's a, it's a pretty good rule of thumb to like, okay, I'm, I'm waiting for the tutor or the TA or something like that. I'll give them 10 minutes Yeah. versus the professor gets 20 versus the students just get five. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, any questions about synthesis stuff yet? Everybody get their their um, geometries lab turned in. That went okay. It takes a little getting used to, but it is a decent skill to have if you're going into to any research field these days, or any or think you might want to go that way because anything in the sciences you got to be able to think in 3D on a computer. And so even though you might not ever use that exact program again, or even look at molecules that small again, if you go into biochem research, you're doing the same thing, but with um, you know, a protein made up of amino acids instead. Um, but it's still building a molecule, importing geometries, things like that. So um, it has transferable skills, even if it's not entirely obvious right now. It's really warm in here, isn't it? It is, yeah. Okay. I'm always too hot, so I, I never say. <laughs> You're never sure if it's you or the room? Yeah. <laughs> the, only, the only classroom that I'm like not too hot in is, is the one where I have like back thoughts, which I think is like eight inside. I sit like right under a thing. Is so that the one, out the one with no windows? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind that room actually. The light of natural light is a bit of a pain, but it's not that the bad. The staff is like all the way up, so I sit. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to get into a new chapter today, last chapter before the midterm, and we're not probably going to get through the whole thing. Um, but we're going to get into carboxylic acids and acid derivatives. And in a similar way to aldehydes and ketones, a lot of the reactions of these acids and acid derivatives are the same reaction going forward versus backwards, or it's the same mechanism 
um, that, that allows us to convert, say, an acid to an acid chloride to an amide. All of these different acid derivatives have the same mechanism. And it's effectively just an addition followed by an elimination. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward mechanism. So we'll go through them and we'll probably spend both of our time today working on nomenclature because we're going to add nomenclature for five new groups. Um, but they're all groups we've seen before in some capacity. Um, so we'll start with the base, which is the carboxylic acids. They're sort of the, the middle of the road acid derivative. They're the ones we knew about first that occur most commonly. I don't even know if I can say that. Um, they occur commonly in nature. Um, so acetic acid, butanoic acid, hexanoic acid, lactic acid, none of them are actually particular, particularly um, pleasant. Um, with the exception, if you like, if you like uh, vinegar of acetic acid, um, but they do show up in a lot of places, and then also in um, in a lot of medications are acid acids or acid derivatives. Um, so aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. Um, I don't know if they still use four amino salicylic acid. For tuberculosis, I thought I think they just use. You can treat TB with antibiotics now. I'm pretty sure. Um, and I did not get a chance to look it up, but I believe that that's Accutane. Um, it's one of those prescribed acne medications, not an over-the-counter one. I'm pretty sure it's Accutane. Um, but all that really to say that you know these things show up all over the place. Um, naming the acids is just like naming an aldehyde or an alcohol, it's, it's most similar to an aldehyde in that it has to be at the end of a carbon chain, right? Because just like an aldehyde, we have the carbon that's part of the carboxylic acid has three bonds to it already. And so it can only be attached to at most one other carbon. So it has to be at the end of a carbon chain, just like an aldehyde. So we're always going to call that carbon one. And acid's probably the, the um, one of the most important functional groups. Basically, we're adding these from the least important functional groups, the most important functional groups. So if you're ever not sure um, how to name something, what goes at the end as the, the dominant functional group, it's almost always whatever we've added most recently. Um, in this case, carboxylic acids. Um, and along in that same, along the same lines, um, I believe at the, the appendix, nomenclature polyfunctional compounds at the end of the textbook. Basically, it has a list of where all the rules for nomenclature are in the textbook, and it also has a list of um, the order of priority, what gets priority when you're, when you're naming things. Whatever's closest to the top gets, is the highest priority and goes at the end of the, of the IUPAC name. And everything, anything that's in that molecule that's below that you use, you name it as a substituent, which basically means as a prefix, so as a branch. Um, so some of them are a little bit tricky. And a lot of times if you've got a polyfunctional group, it's going to have a common name like salicylic acid or acetyl salicylic acid. Like if you don't know that, that, that salicylic acid So salicylic acid is when you've got the carboxylic acid adjacent to an OH. Once you know that that's the salicylic acid, figuring out that what acetyl salicylic acid is, is not so bad. So a lot of times we'll just use um, common names with the prefixes to modify them as a way of, of doing this rather than trying to name get the IUPAC name for salicylic acid, just call it salicylic acid. But we do have that additional resource 
um, in here. And at the very least, it's got a list of how you name, you know, what the um, uh, substituent name is for each of these. So alkyl, alkoxy, amino, hydroxy, oxo, cyano, etc. Um, so, and, and when we name these, all we're really going to do is just drop the E from the alkane name and then add oic acid. So instead of adding al or all, you add oic acid. So butane with an acid group comes butanoic acid. Um, the old school way of naming these turned it into a Y. So you would have like butyric acid and butanoic acid mean the same thing. Um, there's most of their common names, but they don't even follow a systematic rule. And I'm trying to think of what the, the three carbon acid, it's propan, is it propio, propanil? I guess maybe it's propanil, uh, propanilic acid maybe. It's, it's, they get really weird. So other than these two, oh, it's right there, propionic acid. Um, so for the most part, we don't use those. Should look a little thing before crossing it out. Then um, benzoic acid we do use. Those are the only common acids that we're gonna use regularly in this class other than, you know, or that I would expect you to have memorized. Like I don't expect you to have the structure of salicylic acid memorized. Um, but formic acid, acetic acid, and benzoic acid, I do. Um, those are common enough and they don't have a better name. You know, acetic acid can be named as ethanoic acid, but acetic acid is still by far the most common way to write it. This bottom section, when it's in its deprotonated form, um, that's actually just undoing the rules for acid nomenclature that we learned back in Gen Chem. In Gen Chem, we said, okay, if the, if the polyatomic ion ends in an eight, we add, drop the eight and put it acid, right? Well, we're approaching it from the other point of view here, because instead of treating it as a polyatomic ion that's been protonated, we're treating it as an organic molecule that's being deprotonated, but it's the same rule. So the deprotonated form, you just drop the it acid and you just write eight. So butanoic acid becomes butanoate. Benzoic acid becomes benzoate. Acetic acid becomes acetate. Right, so that's just our way of distinguishing. Sorry, there's a weird shadow on them. Um, sorry, got distracted there. Um, so that's just how we indicate whether it's protonated or not. It's just by dropping the, dropping the ic acid right into eight. And if it's a dia, dioic acid, you just say dioic acid, just like a diol is two alcohols, dioic acid is two acids. So pentane dioic acid just means you've got two acid groups. And that's always going to define, if you have two acid groups, you're naming it using the system, that's always going to define carbon one and two, no matter what the rest of the molecule is, like, or how big the rest of the molecule is. doesn't matter how big the rest of the molecule is. If it's a dioic acid, we're naming it using this system. That's what we're using for our parent molecule. It's just only the three carbons because you have to start counting at one of the acids and end counting at, counting at the other acid. So we would name this one would be something like, so propane dioic acid, with this big
with this big complicated branch off to the side, which would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So a two or a one, two hexyl or one, two dimethyl hexyl. propane dioic acid. Or we could name it just as a regular acid and put the other acid group as a carboxy group. As um, if we named it, so let me draw that same molecule on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six. If we wanted to name an acid group with a prefix, we could name it that way, which would make it a heptanoic acid. I think that would be seven carbons, right? And then call it, let's see, two, three, four, three, four dimethyl two carboxy. So that's indicating that this group right here is an acid. Carboxy is the prefix for an acid group, just like hydroxy means that you have, have an OH attached to something. Carboxy means you've got a carboxylic acid attached to your parent molecule. So you could name it that way. Um, and if you ever hear um, of, any, of any decarboxylation reactions, um, like for instance, the, um, the one that comes up all the time that I get asked about all the time is THCA versus THC. THCA is tetrahydrocannabinoic acid versus THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol. The difference between the two is that you have an extra acid group and the THCA is, is not psychoactive. THC is. So if somebody wants to get high, you have to take THCA and decarboxylate it. You have to remove the acid group, which happens pretty easily when you heat it. Um, so that's why the most common way of ingesting, of uh, taking THC is to smoke it because then you can start from just the raw plant compound, smoke it, and that heat allows, gets it above the decarboxylation point and then it, it becomes psychoactive. If you don't do that, it's not psychoactive and it doesn't have the same properties. And so if, if you hear that phrase, decarboxylation, that's what's actually happening is you're just driving off. Usually what happens is you drive off one of the um, functional groups just by heating this, because it's really close to a fully oxidized carbon, right? It's a CO2. The condensed form of an acid is CO2H. If you just heat that, you can get that CO2H to break off as CO2 in most cases. And then you have a different molecule. And so it's really easy to decarboxylate things, usually just by heating them. So I had a question about naming that molecule. When you named it functional acid, did you count the carbons except for the one? Only um no, did I miscount that? Is it, it, so the carbon one, okay. Yeah, you're right. Because it was six just in the branch before, and then there was two more. So it'd be octanoic acid. Good catch. All 
right? So, but yes, you do count carbon one is the carbon that has the CO2 group, that has the, the acid group, just like with an aldehyde. All right, so here's some practice for nomenclature. Um, when I didn't specify before, but just like with, um, with aldehydes, we had a different, if it was an aldehyde attached to a ring structure, we said it was cyclo whatever carbaldehyde. For acids, we just say the cyclo group carboxylic acid. So it's, so even though we didn't specifically go over this molecule, we should still be able to draw the structure for it, right? It's just going to be a cyclobutane group with an acid attached. Three, three dichlorobutyric acid. Well, start with your four carbons. Add your acid group to one side, call that carbon one, two, three. Right, so this is why we can do add the nomenclature for five functional groups and same at the same time, because it's again the same rules as always that we've gotten really good with. We're just adding a couple new twists to it. Um, and like I said before, I'm not going to expect you to have any of these common names memorized other than acetic acid and formic acid and benzoic acid, which you probably already have memorized or close to it. Um, glutaric acid, I don't know that one off the top of my head. So I would go have to go double check that one. I believe it's in, it's the, the same root as, as glutamate. Glutaric acid versus glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is an amino acid that has, I think it's four. So it's an amino, if it's glutamic acid, we think of it as having, okay, it's got a nitrogen, then an alpha carbon, then a CO2 group. And the R group that's off the side of it, I believe is two carbons than an acid group for glutamic acid. One, two, three. Glutaric acid is the same molecule without the amine. So glutamic acid, the AM in glutamic acid is there to indicate that it's got an amine. Glutaric acid doesn't. I believe that was just on our list here. Yes, yeah, so it's one, two, three, four, five carbons total. I only put four carbons. No, I did put five carbons total. One, two, three, four, five. So glutaric acid, we just get rid of. So the one, two, three, four, five. And Three, three dimethyl glutaric acid is symmetrical on both sides, right? So you could start counting from either side in this case, but either way, if you start counting, carbon three is the same carbon. But again, I don't expect you to have that memorized. I'll either give that to you on a test, or I will give you the IUPAC name, name it pentane dioic acid instead. What's the, what's the uh, name for that molecule? Might help to draw it out instead of having it in the condensed structure. It is. If it was the aldehyde, it'd be formaldehyde, right? 
form is is the really old school way of indicating that you have a single carbon. So older even than using methyl as the prefix, and they would say formal. Which again leads to um, leads to bad chemistry, bad jokes. That's formaldehyde. Then casual aldehyde has a Hawaiian shirt on. You're better. You're a better artist than me. You can draw the. You can draw that on there. People spend time doing that. Um, formaldehyde versus casual aldehyde. Um, yeah, you put a bow tie on formaldehyde. Um, if it's two carbons. You can name it ethanoic acid, but we know that molecule. Remember back when you first learned polyatomic ions, you learned it as C2H3O2 was the, was the deprotonated form or C2H4O2. You even still see it like that sometimes, even though that really bothers chemists when you write it like that, because if, what functional group are you dealing with there? Um, it's acetic acid, but so CH3, CO2H, or COOH, that's sometimes written, um, are all pretty common ways of writing formaldehyde, or sorry, formaldehyde, excuse me, acetic acid, which my coffee. All right, let's do the complicated one, so we can do, let's do, a on 20.3. I'll give everybody a minute. It's really not so bad. You don't even really have to. Don't even have to use parentheses, right? You don't have to use parentheses. It can't be that complicated of a molecule. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's going to be hexanoic acid. It's going to be three, three. Four or tetramethyl. Hexanoic acid. And I don't I know I don't need to remind anybody of this at this point, but if you say tetra anything, you guys specify where all of the substituents are, unless there's only one possible way to arrange it. So you don't need to specify numbers for hexafluoroacetone because there are only six places that you could put a fluorine. But in this case, there's more than four places to put a methyl. So we have to specify where the, all four of the, the methyl groups go. And then B is just is one of those cases where you have to start counting here at the carboxylic acid. So it's not your longest continuous carbon chain, it's your longest continuous carbon chain that starts with your acid group. So you wind up getting pro two propyl pentanoic acid. All right, so one of those things, it, you know, we haven't spent that much time on nomenclature recently, so it's worth going back and double checking that you understand these, this stuff, but um, it's pretty straightforward if you, we've laid the groundwork for it. 
Um, in terms of properties, just because every time we introduce a new functional group, we want to know a little bit about how it's going to react. Um, carboxylic acids are really two functional groups sort of combined, right? Both of those functional groups have polar bonds. One of them has really polar bonds. And so what that means is that we have very, very strong intermolecular forces, and that's going to affect our boiling points and melting points. Carboxylic acids in general um, don't melt or boil until pretty high temperatures relative to their molecular weight. Um, you know, even if we got something, you know, T-butyl alcohol, it's going to be really close to the same molecular weight as acetic acid, but it's going to have a way lower boiling point. I'm actually curious, so hang on. Don't trust that though. 82 to 83, it says. Well, that's fun. I didn't, I wouldn't have thought that it would crystallize out to be blue. Learn something new every day. So 82 to 83 Celsius versus molecule that's got the same molecular weight has a boiling point 20 degrees higher. Uh, four, sorry, 40 degrees higher. So it's because we get even more um, intermolecular forces, and those wind up being the most important thing for determining boiling point. What would be so I guess the pentane would be the al would be the alkane that has the same number of heavy atoms, right? It's gonna be close to the same molecular weight. And pentane's boiling point is like just above room temperature. I want to say it's like 40 Celsius. The property that we care most about though is their acidity and that's that's what how they're named right so that's kind of an indication that the fact that they have a um a very acidic proton alcohols can have an acidic proton if the resin is stabilized in their deprotonated form but carboxylic acids by definition when they're deprotonated you have a stabilized, resonant stabilized structure there, right? Because the, the two, what's the, what would the other resonant structure look like? It's stabilizing the acetate. We just move the extra pair of electrons towards the carbonyl carbon and push the other ones up. It looks like the exact same structure, but switched, right? But the fact that we have two choices for where to put that negative charge means it's got two identical resonance structures, which makes it more stabilized, which means it's pretty easy to deprotonate these. Um, so for most of them, pKa is around four to five. It'll depend a little bit on electron withdrawing groups and if there's any extra resonance. So acetic acid and propanoic acid, their pKa's are really close to the same, right? Because you've got a methyl as your electron donating group versus an ethyl as your electron donating group. They're both about the same level of electron donating. But if it's benzoic acid, that's significantly more acidic. pKa is lower. Because 
not only do you have these two resonance structures stabilizing it, you also have the benzene ring that can donate electron, or the, the electrons can resonate into. And so you wind up with extra resonance stabilization. Um, but even more significant than that is if, the, if you have an electron withdrawing groups attached, like these, these chlorines attached, acetic acid is pKa of 4.8. Chloroacetic acid is 2.9. Dichloroacetic acid is 1.3. And remember that this is this is a log scale, right? So chloroacetic acid is almost a hundred times more, more acidic than regular acetic acid. And dichloroacetic acid is more than 10 times more acidic than monochloroacetic acid. Right. So when you have electron withdrawing groups, remember that the way that that works, is if you're pulling electron density away, if you're pulling electron density away from your acid group, then you don't have as much negative charge to hold on to that plus. Remember that hydrogen, the proton, is positively charged. So if you don't have as much electron density, that proton's not as attracted to that acid group. So more electron withdrawing means um, a more acidic proton. Which we've talked about to some extent already, right? We talked about that for, well, I guess for the nucleophilic addition reactions for aldehydes and ketones, right? Electron withdrawing meant that they were um, more reactive. You had a bigger partial positive for a nucleophile to attack. Same logic. All right, so let's talk a little bit about pKa. Because just from this last slide, you might be able to, to infer that lower pKa means more acidic, but let's talk about why that is and what's a good way to think about pKa. And it comes back to this equation that you probably haven't seen since Gen Chem, also known as the buffer equation. The real name is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, um, there's two ways you can use it really. You can use it to say, okay, I have this weak acid with a certain pKa, how do I make a buffer at a certain pH? And that's, that's great. That's the way most biochemists and biologists think about this equation. For OCHEM though, P, pKa winds up being really useful in determining whether which of these two forms is more common? Because what happens, what happens to this equation when you have the same amount, you have an equal concentration of HA and A minus as the protonated form and the deprotonated form? What happens to that ratio? It would just be one, right? And what's the log of one? Zero. So when you have, so when concentration of A minus equals concentration of HA, and A minus, once again, is just our, our placeholder, generic deprotonated weak acid. HA is the protonated weak acid. When A minus equal to HA, pH equals pKa. And we talked about this, but I think it's been, I think we've talked about it back in October or so. So it's been a while. And so this might make more sense now. So if pH 
equals PA, pKa when you have an equal amount. We can just look at the pH relative to the pKa to know whether most of my acid is protonated or deprotonated. Because this, what is the reaction we're, we're actually looking at here is is this reaction, right? When, if your pH is more acidic than pKa, that means you have extra H plus around, right? If you have extra H plus around, what does that do to Le Chatelier's principle? What's gonna happen? So let's say that we're at equilibrium when pH equals pKa, when everything's totally balanced. If we make it more acidic than that, that means we added HA, right, or H plus. And what does Le Chatelier's principle say? If we were at equilibrium when they were equal amounts and then we added H plus, what happens? Which way does equilibrium shift? Towards, um, Towards HA, right? So if you have extra H pluses around, if you're more acidic than pKa, you have extra HA around. In other words, the bottom half of this equation of this ratio is bigger than the top half. Right, so when pH is less than pKa, you have extra HA. And so extend that logic the other direction. If we are sitting at equilibrium with pH equals pKa and we make and we increase the pH, increasing the pH does what to H plus? Goes down, right? So if pH, if H plus concentration goes down, what happens to A minus concentration? It's going to go up. You're going to steal some HA and turn it into A minus. All right. So there's a lot of different ways you can phrase this. And so it makes sense to think about it until you find one that works for you. I always go back to at equilibrium, or if you have an equilibrium right here, and then I tweaked it. All right, and then I can just think about it like with Chatelier's. If I have, if pH is above pKa, I'm missing H pluses. Therefore, I need to make an extra A, A minus. Or you can think about it in the context of if you raise your pH, you're adding hydroxide. You're adding a strong base. That strong base is going to deprotonate your weak acid. It's going to steal a proton from your weak acid and drive equilibrium that way. Those are really the two ways you can you can think about it. But to me, I like starting here as my my baseline and just compare everything back. And then all of a sudden that makes these numbers, it gives them you some context. In order to get to get your acetic acid to be 50% protonated, 50% deprotonated, you have to get to a pH of 4.8. To get chloroacetic acid 50% deprotonated, you have to get all the way down to 2.9. You have to be get to a more acidic pH to get to that 50-50 ratio, right? So the lower your pH, the more acidic your compound is because you have to get to more acidic conditions to make it 50-50. Something with a pKa of 10, means that to have a 50% protonated, 50% deprotonated, you actually have to get it to basic conditions. And so that's why how we define a weak base versus a weak acid 
it's really the same process either way. It's just a matter of do you make your pH high to get to 50-50 or do you make your pH low to get to 50-50. So, Again, the more ways you have of thinking about it, working it through in your head, the more it's going to make sense in all the different ways of thinking about it, right? Because you're going to have to develop a well-rounded understanding of what's going on. Here's one way we can ask questions about it. Acetic acid is dissolved in a solution buffered to a pH of 5.76. Do you have more, so just qualitatively first, do you have more HA or A minus? So pKa. Is 4.76. Correct. We have mostly the deprotonated form, mostly acetate present. And if we want to put a number to that, we just plug in our pH and our pKa here and solve for A minus over HA. Just treat A minus over HA like it's one variable, just solve for the ratio. And try to, instead of trying to solve for a single variable, 5.76 equals 4.76 plus log A minus over HA. So subtract 4.6 from both sides, we just get one, right? How do you do a base undo a base 10 log? Ten to the power of, yeah. So in the way that I always remember logs, laws of logs are tricky, right? When it comes to figuring out how to undo them. What I always remember is that a log is solving for an exponent. So this is log, so it's log base 10. So what this is saying is, is whatever's in the parentheses in a log is what your exponent, your base to your exponent was equal to. So the purpose of a log is to solve for an exponent, right? So, 10 to the one equals a minus over ha. There's other ways you can remember it. I, people have always, I've heard people say things like, you just do like a little umbrella hook or something, button hook or something like that to grab your base and pull it to the other side. Um, I never learned it that way. So that's not the way my brain works, but if that works for you, that's fine. Basically you raise 10 to the power of each side cancels out the log. So 10 to the one equals A minus over HA. So our ratio of A minus over HA is 10. Or you could write it out. Okay, good. Yeah, the, just remember the whole purpose of the log is to solve for an exponent. So what when you have a log, what's on the other side of the equals is supposed to be the exponent. Um, if we rearrange this a little bit, we can get A minus is 10 times HA. Okay, we just solve for a ratio. We solve for concentration of A minus in terms of concentration of HA. Either one of these answers the question though. It just, and they, it also answers our qualitative question too, right? We have 10 times more HA or A minus compared to HA. And, if, you know, if you think about this as an equilibrium 
um, on spins products over reactants, basically, right? So if your ratio of products over reactants is 10, you have more of whatever's on the top part of your equation. By a factor of 10 to 1 in this case. So every factor of 10 away from pKa is going to be give you a power of 10 difference in the ratio. If we go back to this question, if we made this 6.76, then the difference between pH and pKa is two pH units, right? Which when we go through the same process, we'll get 10 to the two equals A minus over HA. Or a hundred times. So every pH unit away from pKa is a factor of 10 difference in those ratios. And which is why it's such, when we do like acid base extractions, um, we're trying to get the pH you know, three or four pH units away from a pKa, because if you do that, then that means you've got an 1,000 to one or a 10,000 to one ratio of protonated to deprotonated or vice versa, which means you can say pretty conclusively, I know that almost all of my product is in the deprotonated state or the protonated state, and that affects solubility, right? Because if we're talking about benzoic acid versus benzoate, which of those is going to be more soluble in water, protonated or deprotonated? Soluble in water? Polar, and what's even better than polar is charged, right? So whichever form is charged is going to be more soluble in water. So by tweaking the pH, we can determine, okay, this is going to dissolve in my non-polar layer. But if you if you increase the pH to deprotonate your acid, you can say now it's going to be more soluble in my polar layer. Right, so it winds up being a really helpful tool to know whether you're in your polar and you're protonated versus deprotonated and what that does to your charge when it comes to determining this. We did spend some time on this in, in OCHEM 1, right? Or am I mixing up last year? Did we talk about solubility versus pH? I think so, I think so, so too. Often. It was a bit. <laughs> it's been a minute. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after, and then we'll um, we'll review this acidity a little bit and then get into other acid derivatives. 10 after. So, Sean, I, my brother's getting married in Florida Memorial Day weekend. The whole family's flying to Florida, but our flight just changed out of Reno. So we were going to fly out Tuesday night. But now that flight doesn't work anymore, so we have to fly out Monday night. So I'm going to miss the Tuesday before Memorial Day. But it's 24th. Okay. If it's possible to do like a more computer lab that day, or not um, to make the whole class about me, but. <laughs> well, you are a third of the class. I am a third of the class. <laughs> um, let me see what we have on this schedule okay real quick yeah because i'll be here and that's the only i'll miss the thursday but the lecture i can just watch later so the lab i want to see if it was the 25th you say the so 20 you're, or I'm you're day flying, 24th you're flying out the 24th we're flying out the 24th yeah um i think we can i think i can swap these next two labs Okay. The material won't match up quite as well. It'll be it'll be close. I can okay. make that work. Yeah, we can do that. And I'm here the rest of so I flying out um again the the twenty 
first at night. So if I could take the lab, would I be able to take the final on the 21st instead of the 23rd? Or I can really do it the 20th or 21st because we have the red eye out on the 21st of June. Um, so I think the date's wrong on here, right? It's Thursday the, it's the it's 23rd. It's Thursday the 23rd, yeah. yeah. So we take, the, so we leave like midnight on the 21st. Okay. So if I could do the final. We could do that on the Tuesday. Awesome. Yeah, that yeah. would be perfect. Okay. Um, um, when we get close, like the week before finals, remind yeah. me, send me an email. For sure. Um, okay. Because you know how I write tests. Yes. So. Yes. Well, everyone's wedding was postponed to this year. So we're like, oh, a I lot remember. of travel coming up. I finally just made it past that stage in my life where I'm like I actually didn't have any weddings to go to during yeah. COVID. I had one, the one that got in that was Laura's little cousin. Yeah. Um, that we would have gone just because they live in California. Before, yeah. But we would not have flown to it probably. Yeah. So, so that's and like both of my cousins are getting married in the fall, but I, it definitely won't be a whole family trip. If, if I go, it'll just be like me going. For yeah. A day. It's just like the boys are so hard to travel with right now. Three year olds. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> right. It's, it is brutal. <laughs> we got ours trained to do road trips. And so as soon as as soon as we had to start buying two plane tickets. Yes. But Minnesota's a lot closer than Florida. It's a exactly. thousand miles closer. And like the, the weddings, so we have a wedding. Uh my cousin on my dad's side is getting married in Miami. Mm -hmm. And my cousin on my mom's side is getting married in Austin, Texas. So it's like we would have to fly. To Texas is doable, it but well, be. not not if we didn't have the current gas prices. Yeah, yeah. Right now, it's not. You yeah. know, probably they, it would probably be cheaper to fly. Like, they do awesome in the car. They're yeah. totally happy in their car seats, planning their trip. But something about the plane is just. Hopefully, they're better now. The last time we flew was like in December, so you know they're like eight months older. Yeah, they may have. That's yeah. that's like a quarter of their life. Yeah, yeah. You know. So I think it'll be. I'm holding out hope because we're going to Florida, and then the next month we're going to New York. So we have two like long haul flights coming up. You know, and you probably don't have time to do this now, but we we um back when we were flying before Valence turned two, um we did lots of small flights. Yeah. And that gets them used to the routine in a yeah. lower stress situation. And then yeah. they handle the big flights a little bit better. Yeah. But, you know, it's so expensive. It was the only reason we were able to do that is because my dad was, was racking up frequent, he was hitting his, the hard cap on his frequent flyer miles. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, and that's like my, my husband used to have to travel all right. the time for work. So he had tons of points, but now, you know, it's a little. He has to travel as right. much, so we really don't have to have as many points anymore. So we're just doing plenty. We we have a red eye to New York, so I'm hoping that they'll be like so soft and tired, and I'll like go some with Benadryl before we get on the plane too. Dramamine works pretty well too. Oh, Dramamine. It's not it's not quite as sedative, but it also if if they're getting antsy because they have a little bit of motion sickness, yeah. the Dramamine is also mildly a set of Oh, too. that's good to know. Maybe we'll um, try that. That's, that's what we do. My son gets car sick and he, he has a habit. Of, it's not the windy roads because he's a mountain kid. It's when we get on roads to do this. Yeah. Like just north of Susanville, there's this stretch of highway that is super straight, but it has these like 20 foot up and down hills and yeah. he loses it every oh, time like 10 miles north of Susanville oh, um gosh. and so but we dose him with the dramamine the second he starts feeling a little bit woozy yeah and then he knows like if I just go to sleep now I'll wake up and I'll feel better yeah but oh, yeah. He, you know, he's also eight not three yeah and yeah it took him until six to be able to do that reliably so yeah yeah so we'll see how it goes and that's yeah. like the the flight to florida the original flight we booked was it was kind of like two three hour flights with a like short layover with like an hour long layover and then they changed us to like flying to la so having a really short flight then having like a four hour long layover and then having a cross-country flight to fort lauderdale we're like that's going to be 
a disaster. <laughs> I want no part of that. What did you say your reason for four-year-olds? I'm flying with my family, so with my husband and our two three-year-olds. And for my brother's wedding, my brother's getting married in Florida uh, over Memorial Day weekend. But they've been, so we booked these flights like months ago and they've been changing the flight schedules a lot. So like, yeah. it, like really significantly, it's not just like, oh, your leg over went from an hour to an hour and a half. It's like, no, you have to take this leg of the flight to LA instead of Phoenix now and you have to do, yeah. So. Well, that, and, it, and even that's better than for a while when they first reopened after COVID, um, or when people first started traveling, and they were just full on canceling flights. Yeah. And like, well, we'll get you on, we'll put you on to the next one. But they were canceling on a day of. Yes. Yeah. So my father in law spent three days in Reno because they said, okay, you're canceled, your 8, 8 p.m. flight's canceled, it's going to be 11 p.m. And then it gets to 11 p.m. Really? And they said, you're, yeah, you're, it's actually going to be 6 a.m. tomorrow. Oh, my God. And it took him, it took him two and a half days to actually get a flight that time. Um, yeah, so, so I'm grateful, you know, they did this in yeah. like almost, you know, it was like a month and a half in advance that we got the notification that it had changed so much. So it gave us some like, yeah, but, yeah. You know where we're going to go today? Uh, I remember he said he had something going on. I can't recall what it was. Hmm. Rigney, if you're watching the recording, I promise I do pay attention when you talk to me. I just don't remember what's going on today. <laughs> Um, I was having a conversation, I don't remember very well because it was uh, kind of a while ago, but we were talking about like um, THC and THCA mm -hmm. and um, the safety of like CBD products with yeah. animals um, because dogs and cats cannot have any THC because they have more um, cannabinoid receptors. And uh, if, if they take THC, it can have like really negative effects like like nausea and dizziness and I think even more dangerous ones. So if your dog ever like consumes any um, yeah, they should be like taken to the vet immediately. Yeah, that's and that doesn't surprise me. And what and given the the current um I don't want to call it a, a fad because I think there's likely some some valuable um, benefits of stuff like CBD, but right now it's kind of, it's really unclear what those benefits are. And so it gets, yeah. it's called a panacea when something gets touted as being a, a cure for everything. Yeah. Um, like everything has CBD in it right now. And some of it might be helpful, some of it not, but some of it also could be harmful. Like people are giving their dogs CBD for their joints or you know, stuff like that. And, but it's not, we don't know enough about how CBD works in humans, let alone in dogs at this point. So there's definitely some, some weirdness with that. And people need to be careful because it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that CBD is claimed to have benefits for, it's probably snake oil. It's probably just placebo effect, if anything. Um, but and the people making the CBD don't necessarily have the chemistry background or the um, morality to make sure you get rid of all the THCA. So, so a lot of times, a lot of those products that that are um, aimed at pets might still have THC in them because it's not regulated at all. THCA in them just because it's not regulated at all. My question point, was, so. um, if it's, if it's THC that's psychoactive, then, um, when like a dog consumes, like maybe you have, your dog like accidentally consumes something that you left out that's like unburnt, mm -hmm. how is that harmful to them if it's not THC, if it's THCA? So I don't know. So THCA does have some properties in the human body. It doesn't affect your mind. So it could be the same way with dogs too, where, um, and I think what you, what you said and what I, what I had heard before is THCA is, THCA is really harmful to dogs. Uh, THC is what I've heard. 
So I don't know about it. So it, in that case, consuming the, the raw plant materials would be fine because THCA is form that it's in in the plants. But I think that's also harmful to dogs. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think it was harmful to dogs. Oh, it's not? I thought it was just THC. Okay. Um, so that's why I was asking, like, why worry if they just consume the plant? It's like not this. So, so it, anytime the plant dies, so when it's picked or dried, et cetera, um, you wind up with, with some de decarboxylation happens at room temperature just slowly. Um, and so you could, you can wind up with a, an amount of THC in the plant that's not harmful or even noticeable to humans, but might be harmful to dogs. Okay. If it's, if they're that sensitive to it, and again, it, it's going to be affected by like, was it stored in an open container or was it stored in an airtight container is going to affect that. It was it stored in sunlight? Was it stored in your car? Where in your car gets to high temperatures in the sun, that's enough to decarboxylate. Sometimes you only have to get it to like 200 Fahrenheit to like reliably decarboxylate it. So if dogs are that sensitive to THC, it'd be pretty easy to have a dangerous amount of THC in the plant material, even if it's too small of an amount for humans to notice. Um, but I'm also just going off of memory to some extent. Yeah. Um, so, you know, do more research than that, but that is, yeah. You know, and that's, that's why if you're, if you're making edibles, you have to, um, you have to heat it up. You either have to make something baked, um, or you have to treat the THC or the THCA extract at a high temperature. Um, in order to decarboxylate it. And so like when people make tinctures and stuff like that, that's meant to be consumed, but not baked. Um, they usually do it by basically take, take the plant material, heat it in an oven above the decarboxylation temperature, and then you take it out and, and soak it in ethanol or something like that to extract all the, the organic components but it's that heating it in the oven that goes through the decarboxylation process. Um, and then, then it would be really dangerous to dogs and you'd have to really watch out for it. So edibles in general would be way more dangerous for a dog than the plant material. Some people swear by CBD for the dogs. Some people are like, yeah, it doesn't really do anything. There's a lot of that with, and a lot of times it's, it's interesting in people too. and in people too, but it's interesting placebo that applies to people projecting onto their pets as well. Like getting, it's understandable that placebo effect would affect you, but people also think things are more effective than they are on their animals because they project the fact that they gave them this treatment and, and to some extent to the dogs too, right? Cause the dog might just know like, I don't know what this stuff is. I feel the same, but my owner's paying extra attention in the, when, when they give me this CBD rub on my joints. And that's enough to make the dog feel better. And so what they're really noticing is that the dog likes when you pay attention to it, which shouldn't be a, a shock to anybody, right? Yeah. Um, but people that already pay a lot of attention to their dogs might not notice their dog might be fine or if it's not an affectionate dog. Like my dog hates when people touch her. If I, if I rubbed CBD oil on her joints, she would be like, what the heck are you doing? Get away from me. Well, most dogs don't like taking CBD because it's usually taken orally for like a tincture or a treat. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's likely some some a lot of good benefits to CBD, but we don't really know what they are and they're not scientifically supported at this point. It's all just conjecture. There hasn't been enough study done to really know for sure. But like I said, I think that there probably is, there probably are benefits. Um, so I don't want to dismiss it out of hand, but I also am not going out and buying CBD for every time I feel a little bit of an ache or pain or get sick because I don't know what it's good for yet. Anyway, if we are ranking these compounds in terms of acidity, 
it helps to be able to, to know what the structure is, right? So I'd start by drawing it out. So we have two four dichloro, two three dichloro, or three four dimethyl butyric acid. And three four dimethyl. Yeah, and then three three dimethyl butyric acid. This three four. So if it's butyric acid. If it was 3,4-dimethyl, that'd be that, which would just be pentanoic acid. So let's call it 3,3-dimethyl. Versus 2,3-dichloro. Oh, they probably meant 3,4-dichloro, butyric acid. I would guess, because then they're all dichloros. Let's do that. That makes more sense. Versus two, four. Which of these is going to be most acidic? All the same number of carbons, all the same number of chlorines, just a matter of which number more electron density on the acid group means less acidic, it means it's holding on to that proton tighter. So that would be having your chlorines as far away from as possible, right? Is that going to do? Are they going to be able to pull? Think of it in terms of shielding, like an NMR. We said that things were more shielded when they were further from the electron withdrawing group, right? Shielding is another way of saying electron density. So the two, three. So two, three should be the most acidic. This one would be the least acidic. Because having the chlorines all the way over here means that more or less that acid group is not really all that different than normal. Having them as close as possible should be the most acidic. At the very least, Here's a good test taking strategy. And a question like this, you should always be able to identify the middle. Figure out what's changing between your three options and figure out what goes in the middle at least. Even if you have your logic backwards, you can get one out of the three right, as long as you're consistent, right? Which if this was a multiple choice test, and your, your options were, you know, one is greater than two is greater than three, or one is greater than three is greater than two. Have, knowing what the middle one is allows you to eliminate one, probably at least, of your, your possible choices, which increases your odds, even if you just guess on the rest of them, on, out of the rest of the options. One bromine, like the third position, and two on the second. So, like the two would be, or the third would be further away. Yeah, I guess so. Was it the position or the number of bromines? So, in this case, it does actually, when we draw these out, we'll be able to see that it, it doesn't matter in this case because our, our options are pretty easy. But if you had the case where you had two bromines on carbon three versus one bromine on carbon two. Um, generally, how close it is matters the most. Okay. It's that's in that great when you have when you have two different variables, 
that are working in opposite directions, it gets hard to make generalizations because there is a crossover point always, right? Like if we're talking about fluorine, then maybe two fluorines on carbon three matters more than one part fluorine on carbon two. But bromine not being as electronegative, maybe that doesn't matter as much. Or what, are, what if it's carbon four instead of carbon three? Right, so when you have the, if you have more than one variable changing, typically on, on a, the way that these questions are written, they have to be written so that those variables work together or you can't make generalizations about it. So in this case, the, the next one, So we have one bromine on carbon three, two bromines on carbon three, or two bromines on carbon two. Bingo. Most, least, middle. And I'm not saying we can't answer that question when you have the competing variables, but we would need more information or that would have to be a higher level class where, where you're expected to not, you're not seeing this stuff for the first time. Um, so if you did see that, that's just a poorly written question at this point until you get to more upper division chemistry. All right. So a couple ways, the first thing all of our chapters do when we introduce new. New functional groups is we say, well, how do we make these functional groups? We have three ways to make carboxylic acids at this point. Um, you can make a carboxylic acid by doing ozonolysis of an alkyne. You can oxidize a primary alcohol, or you can oxidize in a benzylic carbon as long as it has a hydrogen in the benzylic position. Remember, we needed that hydrogen for that process to work. So, cool. Just let's just recap. We've already talked about those, and other than those analysis, the other two we don't even have mechanisms for because those oxidation reactions that involve chromates and other metals, they always go through weird oxidation reactions that um, we know some of them, but they're beyond the scope of this course. We're getting into in or um, metallo organic chemistry when we start getting into that um, crossover between organic and inorganic, and so that's again upper division stuff um, we do have a chapter on organometallics but we might not even make it there we've already the ones that we've covered are the big ones other than those three the other two methods of making carboxylic acids one of which we just added Um, this or last chapter, we make a nitrile and then expose it to acid and heat. We can oxidize that carbon, convert that carbon into a carboxylic acid. Um, and that one, it's not technically an oxidation. It looks like an oxidation, but remember that carbon nitrogen triple bond, the nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon to begin with, right? So we have, we're adding carbon oxygen bonds, but we're doing that at the expense of carbon nitrogen bonds, which means the carbon is just as oxidized as it was before. The oxidation state on the carbon doesn't change in this case. Um, the oxidation state on the nitrogen changes. The nitrogen has to get oxidized. So I believe it, the nitrogen is given off as N2 gas. So it goes from an oxidation state of Minus three. One, two, three, six, eight. Yeah, an oxidation state of minus three to an oxidation state of zero. 
So the nitrogen gets oxidized in this case. Or so, yeah. You can stop talking about the nitrogen because I'm confusing myself. Um, but the carbon stays the same oxidation state. So it's not technically a oxidation reaction. The other one is actually one that we did in lab. When we made our Grignard reagent, we then took the Grignard reagent, we carboxylated it. The opposite of a decarboxylation is a carboxylation. We took our Grignard reagent and we added a CO2 group to it, a CO2H group to it um, by reacting it with CO2. So we actually know what this reaction looks like. Mix it with dry ice, let it react, and then acidify it at the end. Um, so that's another good way we have of adding a CO2 group or a, a um, carboxyl group in a very specific spot because we could make this Grignard reagent out of any haloalkane, right? We use um, phenyl bromide, bromobenzene, but we could have done it with any bromoalkane. And wherever you put the, wherever the bromines attached is where you attach the magnesium and therefore also where you would attach the CO2 group. Um, if we're going to reduce these, <clears throat> This is the one where we have to go bring out the big guns. Lithium aluminum hydride is the only reducing agent we have that will reduce a carboxylic acid and it reduces it all the way to the, to the primary alcohol. We, there's one way to reduce carboxylic acids selectively by using borane in tetrahydropuran. It will reduce a carboxylic acid but not reduce a ketone or an aldehyde, which is a neat trick. So that's the opposite. If we wanted to reduce a carbonyl without reducing the acid, we could use sodium boral hydride, right? Because it's strong enough to reduce the ketone, but not strong enough to reduce the acid. Here, orane in THF is the opposite. Something about this mechanism is such that it will reduce an acid, but not reduce a class two carbonyl. So again, helpful in terms of selectivity when it comes to things like synthesis. You get your ketone where you want it, and now you just need to reduce your acid. Here's a way you can do that. All right, the rest of these acid derivatives, we're gonna kind of cover them all at once. Um, because they have a lot of similarities. In each case, the, the carbon that's highlighted here is the carbonyl carbon. Um, it's still a carbonyl, except it's a carbonyl and it has a good leaving group attached. That's the difference between our class one carbonyls and our class two carbonyls. Class two was aldehydes and ketones. Class one is acids plus all of these including nitrides. So we can convert back and forth between all of these. So here's our acid group and our nitrile. All of them, the carbon has the same oxidation state. And in all of them, we can convert back and forth between all of these pretty easily. Nitriles are harder to convert back and forth because their leaving group is not as good of a leaving group, but we just went through a reaction a second ago, right here, where we converted a nitrile to an acid, right? So it's a little bit of the, the special snowflake of the bunch, but for the most part, it still fits into that same category. So let's name, name these. For the most part, we're gonna name them just like we're naming the acid um, because they still also share the same pro um, property of 
they have to start, they have to be at the end of a carbon chain. You can't have any of these in the middle of a carbon chain. So instead of, so for the acyl halides, you drop the ic acid and you put YL, and then you say the name of the, the halogen. So acetic acid becomes acetyl bromide or acetyl bromide. Sometimes that one's pronounced strangely. Benzoic acid becomes benzoyl chloride. And so you wind up with this weird little Yiddish sounding thing at the end of your, your names for a lot of them, because all of those that ended in oic acid now end in oil, O-Y-L. And then instead of acid, you say the name of the halogen. So propanoic acid becomes propanoyl chloride. Um, nitriles are named just by repl replacing the ic acid with nitrile. So acetic acid becomes acetonitrile. The, the O, like there's not a hard rule for the O in this case, because the way that this is written, it makes it look like you'd be adding an extra O. It doesn't become so butanoic acid that already has the O would become um, butano nitrile. It does not become exactly, it does not become butan, butan new nitrile. <laughs> You can do nitrile. Um, anhydrides work the same way. You just replace acid with anhydride. And anhydrides are these this weirdness where you basically link two acids together. Two acids share an oxygen. So acetic acid turns into acetic anhydride because you basically, if you put two acids and put them through a dehydration reaction, then you wind up losing a hydrogen from one side and an OH from the other side and sticking the pieces together. And so you name it just like the acid and they don't, they're don't. they very unstable. The second they hit any moisture, they undo that dehydration reaction and become the two acid molecules again. So acetic acid becomes acetic anhydride. Succinic acid becomes succinic anhydride. So you can actually have this if you have a dioic acid, you can have this happen within the same molecule. Um, malleic acid turns into malleic anhydride is another really common dioic acid. I think that one has it has one extra carbon, so it turns into a six-sided ring, if I'm remembering properly. If it's an asymmetric anhydride, you just say both names, then both acids separately. If it's benzoic acid on one side, and it's acetic acid on the other side, you say acetic benzoic anhydride. When in doubt, add more syllables. Seems to be the chemist's way of approaching things, right? So, so far, nothing that tricky. Esters are the trickiest ones. At least I remember them being the trickiest. Amides have one new wrinkle in that in a, you just drop ic acid and say amide at the end. So acetic acid becomes acetamide. Benzoic acid becomes benzamide. But because that nitrogen has two hydrogens, you can turn that nitrogen into being a, from a primary nitrogen into being a secondary or a tertiary nitrogen. But that doesn't affect our longest continuous carbon chain because we don't count the nitrogen as a number in our carbon chain because it's attached 
um, it's attached to our longest carbon chain. So we just name whatever's attached to the nitrogen, we just name it as a, as a branch. We just say, we use the locant of saying N instead of using a number. Instead of saying one methyl, we'd say N methyl, which works as long as you only have a single nitrogen, right? Makes it really unambiguously clear where that methyl group is attached. You have more than one nitrogen, is it like one N, two N? They do N and N prime usually. So they use what is that? So N versus N prime. Okay. So it's like when you first learned about taking derivatives in calculus, it was Y and then Y prime. Y with a little apostrophe after it before you learned. I'm um, not thinking that far. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we do that as a function. Function, and then if you have f of x, then you can have f prime of x, which it would be the derivative of f of x. But that's that's a not a great way of doing it. It's better to write it as a derivative, which is dy dx. But anyway, that's getting into math, and I'll let the math teachers teach the math. Um, if we have a structure where we have a methyl group in two spots. So for instance, if we had this molecule, this is an amide, our longest continuous carbon chain that starts with the acid carboxylic acid carbonyl or the carbonyl carbon is only three carbons long, right? So this would be Propanamide or propylamide, sometimes people would say it, but that propanamide is the IUPAC way. And then we would have two methyls. So it's, it would be two comma N dimethyl propanamide. So the N works just like a number. It's it's actually a very elegant way of, of handling this, right? Because it doesn't mess with our numbering system that we're used to using. It's just an extra addition to indicate where something is. Right, and so esters, I remember as being the trickiest, but I also don't remember learning them at the same time as the rest of these acid derivatives. So it's possible it just confused me because I didn't have the basis of a look for the carbonyl carbon. And that's carbon one. Um, I remember getting esters really confused because I wasn't sure which side of the oxygen to count from. So for instance, ethyl acetate, it still follows our same rules. We basically name it like it's the deprotonated form of the acid. But instead of giving it a cation, so instead of saying sodium benzoate, you use a prefix like you're naming a branch on the other side of the oxygen. So this section is an acid. If it was just a deprotonated acid, that would be acetate, right? Or ethanoate. And then you just name whatever is attached on the other side of the ester as though it was a branch, but you have to make sure you leave a space. The way you indicate that it's a branch on the other side of the ester and not a branch on the carbonyl side is by having it be a separate word. All right, so let's do some examples like that that make that clear what's going on. So this molecule, which side is the quote unquote the acid side of this molecule? What's the parent molecule side of this molecule? That side, right? How do you know? 
has the acid. It has the carbonyl, right? That's the part that I I remember being confused by. Is because that was never explicitly laid out or I was, I missed the class that day. I had OCHEM early, very early in the morning as well. And I was not a great student sometimes. So, so this is our parent molecule. And it's one, two, three, four, five. So this would be pentanoate. And it has a methyl on carbon four, right? So as part of the same word or with the hyphen, say four methyl pentanoate. And then we name the piece that's on the other side of the oxygen as a separate word. So no hyphen, no slamming together. So you can even overemphasize that that's two different words. Ethyl or methyl pentanoate. Let's do another one. What's our parent molecule? If it was the acid, what acid would it be? There's only three carbons, right? So that's, it gets tricky when I make the big side, the side that's not the acid, right? That's when you have to remember, go back to where the carbonyl is. So it's gonna be something propanoate. Because if it was the acid, it would be propanoic acid. Then as a separate word, we name the rest of this. So, and over here, it'd be a propyl group. And then with a methyl on carbon one. So one methyl propyl propanoate. So you always count from the oxygen to that. Yes. So that this is always going to be carbon one. Just like on the other side, the carbonyl carbon is carbon waste. Just like naming something in parentheses, like naming a complicated branch on an alkane, whatever was directly attached to the rest of the molecule was carbon one, right? So it's the same logic here. Whatever's directly attached to the oxygen is carbon one. Right? And then that's the key to indicate that it's two. What's on one side of the ester versus the other side of the ester is that giant space. Um, in your handwriting, when you're doing this, I wouldn't even be mad if you indicated that by um, an underscore. Just make sure your underscore looks different than your hyphens. It, it's easier to indicate a space, actually, in handwriting. It's one of the few things it's easier to indicate than in um, to see than in typing. And so I'm overemphasizing this probably because I remember being very confused by naming esters. Um, it's probably not as hard as I remember it being, given that, that the structure of this class is very different than, than when I first learned it, um, but it's worth paying attention to. If you have a diester, then you just name both sides that are attached and put two spaces. So you have diether, diethyl malonate would be malonic acid that has an ethyl group on each side. So let's 
We've got five minutes. Let's cruise through some practice. Since we just did esters, let's do that one first. So what's the parent molecule? The benzoic acid, right? So drop the ic acid, turn it to eight. So it's gonna be benzoate. And what's on the other side of the ester group? Just a, just a methyl, right? So this is methyl benzoate. And what about I? What's our parent molecule? Is it? So you're so for I. It's a two carbon as benzo or carboxyl acid. So it's going to be acetate or net ethanoate ethanoic acid is catching on more and more acetic acid is sort of becoming old school um but it's still both of them are still both very common at this point so either of those works that's our parent molecule because that's the side of the carbonyl so what's the other side What do we do when we have a benzene as a substituent? It's not a benzyl, it's a phenyl. So benzyl would be like if we had a benzene ring and then one carbon. So because that's got a benzyl, a benzyl carbon, this is a benzyl group. Phenyl group means you have benzene directly attached to something. So it's phenyl acetate for I. And this would be benzyl acetate. About A, what type of functional group is that? It's an anhydride and it's symmetric, right? So just name it like it's the acid, but say anhydride instead of the acid. We'll do B and then um, and then we will be done, and a couple of the others will probably crop up on the quiz this weekend. So what is our parent molecule here? If it was an acid, what would we name it? That's the parent molecule side, right? The carbonyl determines where the parent molecule is, not the longest continuous carbon chain now. So that would be propanoic acid, but it's an amide, so it's propanamide. And if you're the pronunciation, the where you emphasize the syllables is not that critical for this one. So you said it would be propanoic acid, but you drop the oic acid and just put amide. Then we just have to say what the branches are and where they're attached. So what are our branches? 
Diphenyl, very good. And, and diphenyl propanamide. All right. We'll call it there. There was a, another volume heavy lecture today, but mostly nomenclature. We didn't really add any, we only added one new reaction and that's one we've done in lab before. So just a little bit of nomenclature practice and then um, we'll finish, we'll do like, talk about the um, leaving groups and the reactivities. This will be the last topic that we cover on Tuesday before the midterm on Wednesday. So we won't probably make it through the rest of this whole chapter. We'll stop after we get to these reactivities, these, these figures here. All right, have a good weekend.